Good afternoon. <laughs> Thanks for braving the deluge and um, being with us. My name is Robin Kelsey, and along with Ian Miller, my colleague in the history department, uh, I want to welcome you to the Environment Forum at the Mahindra Humanities Center. The center director, uh, Homi Baba, without whom Ian and I would be holding these events in the sub-basement of Widener, <laughs> could, could not be here uh, this afternoon, but he sends his encouragement and benevolence. Uh, his support for our venture is essential, uh, but that said, without the Mahindra Humanities Center's um, Steve Beal and Sarah Razor, uh, Homi, Ian and I would be hosting these events in the sub-basement of Widener. So to them go our heartfelt thanks for all that they do. Um, some of you may know that Harvard has a program called Harvard Heroes that recognizes staff members whose contributions to campus life go above and beyond any reasonable expectation. And last week it was announced that Sarah is a hero, which we already knew, but it is wonderful to have it recognized officially. So I'd like to give Sarah a round of applause. The Environment Forum has a particular uh, purpose. When Ian and I approached Professor Baba with the idea for the forum, we were not content with the notion of sprinkling some humanist uh, ideas into conversations around the environment. We wanted to bring the environment to the center of conversations about what the humanities might be. The aim was not to include the environment in the humanities as one more uh, topic or theme, but rather to ask what happens to the humanities when one takes the immensely challenging environmental conditions under which we live as a pressing and critical fact of human life. I've been speaking of the environment, but of course there are many overlapping environments that touch human lives differently depending on social relations and material circumstances. Wealth and privilege offer buffers from the consequences of environmental disruption, which is incurred largely in the production of that wealth and privilege, while poverty, discrimination, and abjection bring many forms of exposure and vulnerability. In launching the Environment Forum, questions of environmental justice, as well as questions about where theory hits lived experience, uh, were very much on our minds. From the start, Ian and I have wanted this to be an inclusive venture built on an ever-widening circle of students and faculty interested in the intersection between humanistic questions broadly defined and environmental issues. One colleague with whom we knew we wanted to collaborate was Ajanta Subramanian, professor of anthropology and South Asian studies. And this gathering this event on scales of environmental justice, building a transformative politics, is in every profound way her event, and we are so grateful for the vision and energy that she has brought to putting it together. With that, I will turn over the task of further introductions to her. So please join me in welcoming Ajanta to the podium. This event has been a long time in the making, and I'm delighted to have all of my fellow panelists here. Um, so, scales of environmental justice. These are urgent times. We're witnessing the rise of authoritarianism and ethno-nationalist politics the world over. 
In the United States, the election of Donald Trump has ushered in more tolerance for overt racism, greater collusion between government and corporate interests, and the rollback of hard-won advances in environmental and social security. With Scott Pruitt reversing environmental gains at breakneck speed, what is at stake is nothing less than the very idea of the greater social good. These are times that are particularly well suited to environmental justice, a politics born out of necessity and possibility. From the vantage point of environmental justice communities, however, the crisis in ecological and social health has been urgent for a very, very long time. Capitalism, even the democratic kind, has always had its sacrifice zones where ecologies and populations have been treated as expendable. Within the United States, most of these sacrifice zones are poor and non-white and have been subject to repeated histories of marginalization. The list is long. Warren County, North Carolina. Yucca Mountain, Nevada. The Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Flint, Michigan. Chicago's South Side. The Standing Rock Indian Reservation. Puerto Rico. Roxbury, Massachusetts. And on and on and on. These are also places where environmental justice movements have arisen that point to the overlap between race, class, dispossession, and toxicity. These movements illuminate the limits of mainstream environmentalism and the need to bring within its purview industrial regulation, public health, occupational safety, labor rights, urban green space, and sustainable cities. In this sense, environmental justice has always been a universalistic politics aimed at prioritizing public goods over private gain. Although environmental justice was a powerful challenge to mainstream environmentalism, environmental justice activists typically refer to themselves not as the new environmentalists, but as the new civil rights activists. <laughs> and they do so to place themselves within a particular genealogy of struggle, where the rights of non-white populations and the poor have been at the center. Language, or more specifically storytelling, has been an important tool within environmental justice activism for naming and illuminating injustices that have been invisible to a wider public. Take the term environmental racism, coined by North Carolina pastor and community leader Benjamin Chavis in 1982 to describe the siting of a toxic waste dump in predominantly black Warren County, North Carolina. The Warren County mobilization racialized the anti-toxics agenda and generated a whole host of studies on the unequal burden of environmental toxicity borne by US racial minorities. By naming this phenomenon environmental racism, activists expanded the parameters of the term environment and made visible a widespread experience shared by poor and non-white communities across the United States. Similarly, environmental apartheid, another term coined by urban planning scholar and activist Robert Bullard, pointed to the overlap of race, place, and toxicity, and the parallel hazards of black life in apartheid South Africa and the democratic United States. Through these practices of naming, environmental justice disrupts normative narratives about which places and which people have value and shapes alternative imaginations of place and politics. It off also offers ways to channel experiences of harm into public knowledge and collective action at different scales. As our panelists will show eloquently through their work, Environmental justice is a multi-scalar politics that ranges from the scale of the body to that of the home, the neighborhood, city, nation, and beyond. So what does it mean to think about environmental justice at different scales? Environmental justice has always emphasized the importance of grounded experience to transformative politics. As stated in the charter of the 1991 National People of Color Environmental Leadership Summit, convened in Washington, DC, <laughs> environmental justice is about doing environmentalism in the very places, quote, where we live, work, study, and play, unquote. The embodied experience of locality has been key to the making of knowledge, of community, and of politics. The emphasis on the local scale has been a way to foreground the meanings through which people who are typically written out, written out of or simply subsumed within larger narratives make sense of their own lives. 
It's an argument for their agency in interpreting the past, the present, and building a better future. But environmental justice has never been just about the local scale. It's also been about the broader contextualization of local experiences to make clear shared predicaments and enable coalition building. The need to think and act both within and across scales has only grown with the expansion of the movement over time from its beginnings in the siting of dirty industries and toxic <coughs> waste to now taking on issues as diverse as transportation justice, urban green space, housing quality, the beauty industry, militarism, and climate change. Each of these issues has required new strategies and alliances which foreground both the promises and tensions of working in coalitions across scales. We have very powerful examples of such solidarity. Some have involved collaboration between activists and scientists. Public health scientists and women activists have together shown that non-white women's heightened exposure to toxic chemicals in beauty products is an instance of a global health disparity. In doing so, they've linked the toxins in hair straighteners, skin lighteners, and non-white women's bodies to, to structural racism. While toxins are one diagnostic of broader structural conditions, water is another. Water has been at the heart of an environmental justice politics that is both local and translocal. In Gaza, Flint, Durban, Cochabamba, Bhopal, and Standing Rock, residents have demanded the right to water as a safe, evenly distributed public resource. The claim to water as life is a far-reaching critique of commodification, privatization, and settler colonialism that has brought residents into alliance with lawyers litigating on their behalf against both states and corporate polluters. One sees similar efforts to illuminate commonalities through shared struggles around the right to housing, to transportation equity, and to green space. So these are examples of how environmental justice scales up from the most intimate and everyday forms of bodily harm and need to wider systems of oppression. <coughs> by contrast, the climate justice movement works in the other direction. By, reframe, by reframing global warming as an environmental injustice, the movement scales down to highlight the localized differential impact of climate change. As a result, we now recognize enduring differences within a shared crisis that most immediately affects frontline communities, such as the victims of Hurricane Katrina and the Inuit of the Arctic. These and other solidarity movements have connected the dots between an individual health problem or a localized struggle for resources and wider processes of redlining, gentrification, state violence, and corporate power. They've shown how links between scales both perpetuate injustice but can also become key to battling it. And environmental justice as a multi-scalar politics is not just about the relationship between spatial scales. It's also about scales of time. <coughs> By pointing to the birth defects in children born 30 years after the Bhopal gas disaster. By characterizing the water crisis in Gaza and Standing Rock as settler colonialism. <coughs> or Shell Oil's extraction sites as petrochemical plantations or the Anthropocene as the Capitalocene, environmental justice movements offer a different way of thinking an, about and inhabiting time. Not as linear, but as overlapping, continuous, cyclical, or repetitive. Within these conceptions of past and present, there are also ways of reimagining the future. The panelists who have joined us this evening represent a few of the remarkable women, women of color, working on the front lines and across different scales of environmental justice. <laughs> Khalila Barnett is currently the interim director, executive director of the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, a community organization based in the Dudley Street neighborhood of Roxbury. Khalila is also the former executive director of Alternatives for Community and Environment, a leading environmental justice organization in Boston. Khalila has over a decade of experience in community organizing around affordable housing, land development, and environmental justice. She served on the board of Mass Budget and Policy Center, the Center for Environmental Health, and the Center for Economic Democracy. Khalila graduated from Bates College with a degree in American <laughs> Studies and Spanish, and is a Roxbury native and lifelong resident of Boston. Trina Jackson is the practice leader for community engagement at Mission Works, where she manages the Inclusion Initiative, a grant program which funds cross-sector collaborative work 
for economic justice in communities of color. Her background includes facilitating community dialogues and consulting in, on issues of anti-oppression, civic en engagement, economic justice, racial justice, leadership development, collaboration, and community building. Trina is also a gardener and is originally from Louisville, Kentucky. Indira Garmendia Alfaro is a native of Nicaragua and resident of Chelsea, who has worked as a community organizer in Nicaragua and Central America, where she used popular education strategies to engage and empower local communities. Here, Indira has worked to create women-led cooperatives in East Boston and to envision a community land trust for Chelsea. Indira is committed and passionate about creating systemic change to bring about racial justice and immigrants' rights. Tenbit Matiku is a member of Alternatives for Community and Environment, where she has served as a volunteer, development intern, and now community, uh, de development and communications assistant. Born and raised in um, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, her background includes community-oriented education that focused on empowering low-income women to participate in the labor force. She's also been involved in several projects that address issues of homelessness in the greater Boston area. Tenbit earned a sociology degree from Simmons College and is currently studying global studies and international relations at Northeastern University. Her interests are in economic development, environmental research, and global health equity. And last but not least, Amizota received her master's and doctorate in environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health and is now an assistant professor in the Department of Environmental and Occupational Health at George Washington University's uh, Milken School of Public Health. Ami's work seeks to secure environmental justice and improve health equity through advancements in science, policy, and clinical practice. Her research identifies novel pathways linking social disparities, environmental exposures, and reproductive and children's health. Ami received a career development grant from the National Institutes of Health and was recently recognized as a pioneer under 40. She's a baby. A pioneer under 40 in environmental public health. Her research has been featured in national and international media and has helped shape health and safety standards for toxic chemicals. So before turning to our panelists, let me just say a little about myself and why I'm so excited about this. Um, so I'm an anthropologist, um, and my work is on rights politics in India. Um, at Harvard, I teach an undergraduate course titled Politics of Nature, which is devoted to understanding the relationship between environmental injustice and social inequality. And each time I've taught it, Ami and Trina have done guest lectures, and the students have gone on a toxic tour organized by ACE, um, the organization that Tenbit and uh, Kalila have been a part of. And most of the students who take the course, and some of them are actually here, which I'm really delighted about, um, most of them take the course because they have some investment in environmentalism as a politics, and many would even characterize themselves as environmentalists. But a lot of them typically don't think about environmentalism as a social justice politics, and that's what the course really pushes them to do. Um, and this is why I think this panel is so important as an addition to the Mahindra Environment Forum. And my hope is that this conversation about <laughs> environmental justice and local activism um, will have a lasting impact on how we think about the environmental humanities at Harvard. Okay, so let's turn now to our panelists. Um, I've asked each of them to speak for about 10 minutes, um, after which we'll open up the floor to q and So we're gonna start with Kalila. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here on this cold, wet afternoon, <laughs> <laughs> um, especially I'm happy to be here amongst this uh, wonderful group of panelists and um, women who, some of whom I've worked with, some of whom I've just met today. Um, it's a real, it's a real honor for me. Uh, so I was asked to speak about um, the scale of the city in terms of environmental justice. And so I will be talking primarily about my experience and my work in the city of Boston because that is the place that I know the best, uh, for better or for worse. Um, and I wanted to start by talking about uh, this event that's coming up that I hope all of you will participate in that's uh, very inspiring to me. So May 1st is World Asthma Day, and it is also International Workers' Day. One of the organizations that 
I am very closely connected to uh, because of my work at ACE and my activism work is Community Labor United. And that organization has formed a coalition called the Green Justice Coalition. And it's a group of organizations across the state of Massachusetts, community organizations, environmental organizations, and labor unions who are organizing around the intersection of environment and economics. And the event that we're putting together that day um, is called Hashtag Let Us Breathe. And the way that we envision this event is just by this brief statement. Around the world, there are people struggling to breathe. For some, it is the effect of pollution. For others, crippling heat intensified by climate change. And then there are folks like Eric Gardner, whose airways were restricted by a combination of asthma and, bu and brutal force. And for me, this is a real summation of where the environmental justice movement is mm. at uh, at this moment. So in many ways, the, uh, the shape of the environmental justice movement, the kind of battles that we're facing uh, in 2018 are different than they were when I started at ACE and when many of the organizations, uh, the large environmental or justice organizations across the country were formed in the 90s. Uh, the sort of structures that we're fighting against are still remaining, but the battles look a little bit different. And, it, and the struggle really at this moment, I think, is trying to figure out how do we build the kind of power that we need to achieve the kind of change that we wanna see and for us, that's really about the power and control to make decisions about our lives and the ways in which we want to transform our community. And in Boston in particular, I think there's kind of three ways uh, that the landscape of how we're working has really had to change uh, and to adapt. I think one of the biggest drivers is the cost of land and the cost of housing. So, I grew up in Roxbury, um, and during my middle school period, I went. I was bused to uh, a, a school in the suburbs. I was a part of the Metco program, and so at that time period, you know, when I would go to Wayland, where I went to school, and tell people that I lived in Roxbury, it was like, whoa, what? You know, that's it's so dangerous there. I can't believe you've even made it out here. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow I survived, <laughs> you know, all of those years and, um, and was able to be a part of a thriving and beautiful community. But that was, that was the image. But now, many of those people who are uh, contemporaries of my younger siblings are moving towards the city, are buying condos, are starting businesses, uh, and there's a lot of speculation that's going on around the vacant properties around where I grew up. Um, members of our organization of ACE, other organizations that we're closely connected to are facing rent increases and are having to move further and further outside of the city of Boston, outside of their community, um, sometimes even to you know, southeastern parts of the state, so outside of even the greater Boston region. And that's pretty different from the conditions that we were facing in the early 90s. So if you think about organizations coming together during that time, particularly in major cities across the country, you know, dealing with the impacts of, uh, or sort of the consequences of redlining, of disinvestment, the organization that I'm connected to right now, the Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, uh, was when residents came together to get eminent domain powers, to take back control of the land. The other thing that has also very much changed, I would say, is the wealth gap that we're facing. So there's always been a huge disparity, always been uh, troubles and challenges with that. But a recent study that was done in 2016 called The Color of Wealth mentions that white households in the Boston area have a median net worth of a quarter of a million dollars, while black household households have a net worth of $8, $8. So not only you know, are residents facing pressures from a speculative land and housing market, they're not able to find uh, 
the wealth, they're not able to find the income to, to, to bring themselves into place. And then the third piece I think is really important is the actual infrastructure of grassroots community organizing entities uh, across our region. So, you know, while I was at ACE, <laughs> my job was fundraising, uh, was, um, you know, asking for resources to help us build out the organizing work that we needed to do to, uh, to build leadership within our communities. And even during the course of my eight years there, we saw a number of national foundations who moved away from funding grassroots organizing. A lot of money uh, shifted towards a national climate bill. Uh, a lot of money given to large environmental organizations and not given to us. And so the infrastructure upon which we really need to build our movements uh, has gotten more fragile, I would say, over time. And that's really something important to consider and to talk about. But I want to end on a more uh, sort of positive note <laughs> <laughs> and to say and to offer a couple of thoughts about even given those conditions, how do we build the kind of movement that we need? How do we build more uh, events, more collaborations like hashtag let us breathe? So one thing I think is we need to have a bold and audacious vision that goes across a bunch of different boundaries. We need to not be afraid to ask for and to demand the kind of resources that our communities really need rather than just what we think is politically feasible. Um, one of the ways in which we're beginning to do that is by building what we're calling a 10-year agenda. So it is uh, an opportunity for organizations across different sectors to come together and to say, what do we want the state of Massachusetts to look like over the course of the next 10 years? And we're thinking not just about, you know, what does it look like in education? What does it look like in housing? But what does it actually look like when we think about those things in an intersectional way and really do them together? I think we're also talking about this idea of a just transition. So we know because the climate is changing that things are going to keep moving. The change is inevitable, but justice is not inevitable unless we speak out, unless we make a difference. And so using this idea of just transition, we're fueling experiments and projects that would actually have community members make decisions and govern and lead. One of them is a microgrid project that folks in Chelsea are working on and also Chinatown within the city of Boston where there is an, uh, a microgrid that's owned by the community, right? So if there's ever um, a major weather event, uh, you know, we know what the impacts can be when people don't have access to the resources they need, electricity, water, et cetera. So how do we prepare ourselves for those things that we know that are coming, uh, but do so in a way that shifts the ownership, shifts who gets to make decisions about those resources and really begin to make those decisions together? I think, the, in closing, the other things that kind of give me hope and, and signal to the kind of movement that we need to be building is the rise of the climate justice movement. And so we know that that has roots uh, internationally, but also here within the US, organizations like the Climate Justice Alliance, Grassroots Global Justice, are bringing folks together at multiple scales and city scales, local scales, um, regional scales to talk about what does it take to really build a just transition? How do we actually have a hard line against uh, the fossil fuel economy? How do we not allow ourselves to, um, that's my timer. How do we not, how do we not allow ourselves to, to just rest in what is politically feasible but offer solutions and visions for, that are bold and what, uh, and what really needs to happen? I think the other place for a real opportunity and intersection is the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, the ways in which I see people trying to build um, and grow uh, the civil rights legacy in this country. I think there's a lot of opportunity for intersection, a lot of opportunity for leadership development and for sharing of struggles. And so for those reasons and probably more that we'll get to hear, talk about um, in the Q&A, I remain excited. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity. How is it um, 
Jennifer? He, oh, I forgot to introduce Jennifer. I'm so sorry. Um, we're having simultaneous translation from uh, English to Spanish, thanks to Jennifer. How is the speed? Should we speak more slowly? Just a tad? Okay. Okay. All right. Yeah. Um, Trina? I'm going to uh, get up and go to the podium. Set up for me. Beautiful. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Trina, and uh, as Ajanta said, uh, I've had just the honor and the joy of being with her and her students. Uh, it's, it's like an annual, it's like a ritual. Annual ritual. It's yeah. really a, an important part of my own growth, and, um, uh, and, and, and I love it. And so I'm really happy to be invited to speak with you today really about something that I don't talk about a lot. And so this is, I'm not used to talking about this area of interest that I have, so if you bear with me, uh, I'm just getting used, getting familiar with my own interest and, and wanting to share with you. So as Ajanta said, I, I love to garden. I'm not a very good gardener. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've grown up in a family of, of black women who garden. And, uh, and so what I wanted to do was to learn more about African-American women's gardening practices, uh, and in particular how African-American women have not only contributed to environmental justice movement through our gardening practices, but also to U.S. environmental history. Um, and so uh, part of this project came uh, as part of my undergraduate degree work, which I only completed say a little bit about what that means to me. The first thing is that gardens are stories, and they are a way that we author and tell our stories. And so I thought, well, you know, what kind of, how can I make that connection? And so, uh, grown by herself, so, so in, the, in the tradition of the slave narrative, and that they were titled written I took the term thinking that gardens are a way of authoring our stories. Grown by herself is very much in that same tradition, that black women have authored an account of their lives through gardening. And that's what the term grown by herself means. Uh, it also means about black women have ushered and fostered an environmental movement so the environmental movement, environmental justice, has been grown by African American women's gardening practices. I'm just going to grab my water. So, grown by herself, as I say here, is about the role of community gardening in the lives of African American women and their environmental activism. And African American women have been at the forefront of the leadership for environmental justice in the U.S. Uh, our act, they, our, their activism has been about mobilizing communities to shut down power plants um, in their neighborhoods, or work to beautify streets, uh, or even or to convert vacant lots into community gardens. So, and those are just a few examples of how African American women have led an environmental movement. So let me say a little bit about, now how do I bring, oh, here we go. So part of uh, my research for Grown by Herself was thinking about 
the roots of African American women's gardens and what we grow in our gardens and how we developed our gardening practices over time. And so I did a little bit of research and I learned a lot about the provision gardens that enslaved people had um, as part of how they would grow food. So they would you know, work in the fields, so they work in the house, but also enslaved people had their own uh, uh, garden. And you know, of course that varied by situation, but in this illustration here that, that was part of my research, you see what that, you know, what that sort of looked like and what the structure of that is. So you see the dwelling, you see the small plots of gardens, and then you see the women there tending their gardens. And usually, you know, it was women uh, who were doing a lot of the tending of the gardens and so forth and so on. And so there was a lot of like community connection, often different families would come and they would plant together, they'd grow together, uh, and so there was a lot of like relationship building and connection between enslaved families. So that's just kind of a, an illustration that I, that I found as part of my, uh, my research. So I also wanted to talk about the foods that African American women grew in their gardens, and I did a little bit of research on, like, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the the there were lots of different stories about how uh, these seeds or the foods that enslaved uh, African American women uh, grew, and how they actually made it and survived the Middle Passage. So there's all of these stories which I have not really, you know, uh, I haven't learned a whole lot about and find a lot of evidence, but there's a lot of anecdotal evidence about women hiding seeds in their hair or lots of different ways that, you know, some of the, the seeds of these vegetables, uh, you know, yams and collard greens and so forth and so on, food staples that are part of the African-American diet were actually grown in these gardens. That was also like just part of my own learning. Um, and what these practices really meant to me was that, you know, women were, um, you know, they had like a resilience that even in those conditions of enslavement, African American women were committed to uh, a community story and identity that was more about self-determination um, and which has been a constant theme of like environmental justice work. So that, that theme continues to, you know, be the way that we think about environmental justice. It's people directly impacted, telling their own stories, being very self-determined. So I was also interested in like after you know, after, at, at the end of slavery, how did African American women continue the uh, gardening practices, uh, especially for people that stayed in the South? Uh, and so this picture here is just sort of a reflection of how uh, a lot of the foods that people grew, they continued to grow if they were able to hold on to land uh, uh, in the South and, um, this is just sort of uh, a reflection of even the way that people grow food in rows and so forth and so on, uh, and how it just sort of continued to be a way that you know African American women, um, you know, continue to like take leadership just around connection to land, family connection to land, family connection to tradition. Also, you know, I was thinking then, you know, how this sort of evolved over time into um, the vacant lot gardening that became kind of the hallmark of the civil rights movement and the, and the growth of the environmental justice movement with the toxic waste study in the, in the late 80s and the early 70s when, you know, people were, uh, black families were really starting to, uh, you know, want to, uh, be very self-determined about what was happening in their neighborhoods and the disinvestment uh, in black neighborhoods uh, and the open lots that, you know, that weren't, that, the, that, you know, city governments didn't really take care of. So 
you know, families would, and, and, and uh, communities would start to sort of uh, do a lot of activism around the uh, vacant lots. And so it just became sort of, it, it's kind of how this, um, this form of activism evolved and African Amer American women were at the forefront of that. Again, this is just, you know, one reflection of, you know, how this has been, you know, young people have been involved uh, and how they've sort of learned through these kind of practices tr and traditions about what it means to be environmental leaders in their own neighborhoods. So this last slide here, again, represents how black women have continued to, you know, you see this woman here, she's holding up a kale. Uh, you know, as she's marching through the streets. <laughs> um, you know, again, sort of symbolizing the way that black women have continued to be at the forefront of this kind of activism for environmental justice, food justice, um, you know, clean water, safe communities, uh, and how, um, and just being on the forefront of this EJ movement. And so uh, I just, wanted to show that image because I feel like it really reflects how black women have continued in that tradition. Uh, and I think that's it. So um, I, I, you know, to this question of, um, you know, what gives me hope? I mean, I think what we, what's important for us to do is to uh, be able to tell our stories and to listen to the voices of people that really tend to be marginalized within this whole discussion about what, we, what it means to have an environmental movement uh, in the US. And you know, environmentalism, as, as, as folks have been saying before, you know, was sort of couched in this sort of you know, saving the, the, our national parks and the polar bears, and, 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 but not really rooted in an analysis of like where people are living, where they're going to church, where they're going to school and making a lot of these deeper intersections and the impact of environmental racism. Um, and so I really believe that it's important that we lift up the leadership of people that are directly impacted by environmental racism, environmental degradation, um, and that we start to put the solutions and the resources in the hands of those, those communities. So thank you. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Um, soy Indira Garmendia, soy nicaragüense, migrante. Vivo en Chelsea y trabajo en Chelsea. Uh, my name is Indira Garmendi. I'm from Nicaragua. Uh, estoy muy contenta de estar aquí. Estoy muy contenta de elevar mi voz en este espacio. I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy to um, be able to um, have a voice in this type of space. Yo voy a hablar hoy sobre el trabajo que estamos haciendo en Chelsea desde Green Root sobre el tema de la justicia ambiental. Um, I want to talk today about the work that we do at Green Roots in Chelsea and um, how we work with uh, environmental justice. Y quiero iniciar haciéndole una pregunta a ustedes. Si la respuesta es sí, me gustaría que levantaran la mano cuando haga la pregunta. And I would like to ask you a few questions to begin with. And so if you um, would answer yes, please raise your hand. ¿Quién usa sal para derretir la nieve en el invierno? Who uses salt to melt their snow in the winter? ¿Quién ha estado en el aeropuerto Logan de Boston por un viaje? Who's gone to Boston Logan Airport to take a trip? ¿A quién le gusta consumir frutas y vegetales frescos? 
who likes to consume fresh fruits and vegetables. ¿Y quién necesita o usa calefacción en el invierno? And who's, um, who uses their heat in the winter? <laughs> <laughs> ahora, ahora, en la primavera. En la primavera también. Ok. Tengo malas noticias para todos ustedes. So I actually have some bad news for you. <laughs> ustedes sin querer han aportado a la desigualdad ambiental a la ciudad de Chelsea. So without meaning to, all of you guys have contributed to environmental inequality in Chelsea. Y les voy a explicar por qué. And I'll explain why. <clears throat> En Chelsea, en el río de Chelsea, tenemos el 100% de la gasolina que se utiliza para el aeropuerto Logan. Todo está en la orilla del río en Chelsea, East Boston. So, in Chelsea, in the river in Chelsea, we store 100% of the jet fuel that is used by Logan Airport. So, in Chelsea and East Boston along the river. De 70 al 80% del aceite de calefacción que utilizamos en nuestra casa está a la orilla del río en Chelsea. 70 to 80% of the oil that is used for heat in New England is also stored along the river in Chelsea. En Chelsea también tenemos más de 400,000 toneladas de sal que va para la carretera y suministra más de 350 ciudades en Nueva Inglaterra. In Chelsea, we also have more than 400,000 tons of road salt that is used for more than 350 cities in New England. In Chelsea, también tenemos el segundo, el segundo centro de productos eh, de Inglaterra, el segundo más grande en Estados Unidos, que suministra no solo a Nueva Inglaterra, sino a otras regiones del país. Uh, also in Chelsea, we have the second largest produce center in the United States, which not only serves uh, cities in New England, but also in other parts of the United States. Ahora, quiero hablar de quienes viven en Chelsea. So now I would like to talk about who lives in Chelsea. Y vamos a entender por qué pasan, por qué todas estas industrias están en Chelsea. And then we will understand why all of these industries are found in Chelsea. Entonces, quienes viven en Chelsea, son el 73% son minoría, que um, reconocidas también como personas de color. Uh, out of all of the people that live in Chelsea, 73% are ethnic minorities, um, people that we consider people of color. El 24% vive bajo la línea de pobreza. 24% live below the poverty line. De ese 73% de personas de color, el 65% son personas inmigrantes, latinas. Um, out of those 73% of people of color, 65% of those are immigrants, are Latinos. En Chelsea, somos la ciudad con más altas tasas de hospitalización por asma. Um, in Chelsea, we have the highest rates of hospitalization because of asthma. También hacemos un trabajo en East Boston. Uh, we also work in East Boston. East Boston, eh, la, la gente vive en dos millas cuadradas, porque les voy a decir algo, realmente East Boston mide cinco millas cuadradas, pero el tres, tres millas se lo toma el aeropuerto. Um, East Boston, although it's five squared miles, um, the people of East Boston only live on two square miles, and that's because the other three are used up by the airport. El 54, 53% son latinos y el 17% viven bajo la línea de pobreza. 53% of the residents are Latino and 17% live below the poverty line. Ahora, como ven, tenemos mucho trabajo que hacer en Chelsea y en East Boston. So as you can see, we have a lot of work to do in Chelsea and East Boston. El trabajo que hacemos desde Green Roots es, eh, trabajamos para lograr la justicia ambiental. Tenemos mucho trabajo que hacer, tenemos muchas enfermedades, tenemos mucha carga ambiental que recae en nuestras ciudades, en nuestros cuerpos. Um, you know, in Green Roots, we work a lot for environmental justice. 
and we have a lot of work to do, a lot of um, illnesses to, to confront and things that, that we have to solve because they're impacting our bodies. Estamos trabajando para lograr y mejorar una calidad de vida a través de la acción colectiva, a través de la unidad, a través de la educación y a través del liderazgo joven en nuestros barrios y comunidades. So we're trying to uh, re uh, achieve this environmental justice and improve the quality of life through collective action, unity, education, and youth leadership in our neighborhoods and communities. Estos son algunos temas que trabajamos. Trabajamos la justicia alimentaria, de tierra, el poder joven, eh, aire, aire y salud pública, justicia climática. Uh, these are some of the topics that we deal with. As you can see, land and food justice, youth power, um, waterfront access, energy democracy, transit justice, clean air and public health and climate justice. Y para nosotros está claro que no podemos trabajar para la comunidad sin la comunidad. Por eso hablamos de eh, trabajar con la gente, de organización comunitaria, de empoderamiento y de implementación. And for us, it's not that we're trying to work for the community, but rather with the community, because we cannot achieve anything that we want to achieve without working with the community. And that's why we talk about implementing empowering and engaging the community. Quiero comentarles sobre una hemos tenido tenemos más de 23 años de estar trabajando el tema de la justicia ambiental en Chelsea. Hemos tenido varias victorias y hemos perdido otras, pero quiero compartirles una victoria que tuvimos. Uh, we have been working in Chelsea for 23 years. And we have had lots of victories, and we've also had lots of losses. But I would like to talk to you about one victory in particular. ¿Quién de ustedes han escuchado hablar sobre la compañía de energía Cape Wind? Um, how many of you have heard of the power company Cape Wind? Sí. Esa compañía eh, estaba a la misma vez que estaba proponiendo en Cape Cod poner en utilizar energía eólica. Esta misma compañía llegó a Chelsea en el 2006 con una propuesta de ubicar una planta eléctrica en frente de la única escuela eh, en Chelsea, una planta eléctrica. Um, this uh, power company, Cape Wind, in 2006, at the same time that it was proposing a wind power plant in Cape Cod, it was also proposing an electrical plant to be situated right across the street from the only elementary school in Chelsea. ¿Por qué? ¿Cuál es la diferencia? So why? What was the difference? Recuerde, ¿quiénes viven en Chelsea? So just remember who lives in Chelsea. ¿Quiénes viven en Cape Cod? And who live in Cape Cod. Entonces, eso fue una de las de nuestras victorias. Logramos parar esa planta eléctrica. Este es un montaje. Así se vería si esa planta eléctrica hubiera sido construida justo enfrente de la escuela. And in 2006, we were able to um, uh, beat the company. We were able to beat this proposal so that it wasn't built right across the street. This is um, just a, 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 an idea of what the electrical plant would have looked like if it had been constructed right across the street from the elementary school. Logramos detener ese proyecto a través de acciones públicas, testimonios orales y escritos, firmas de residentes, abogacía legal, y la pelea duró año y medio, pero ganamos. Um, we were able to stop this project with public action, oral and written testimonies, collecting signatures from the residents of the city and legal advocacy, and we were fighting for a year and a half, but we were finally able to win. Para terminar, me gustaría compartirle, estamos haciendo muchas cosas, porque ustedes ya vieron, tenemos mucho trabajo por hacer, pero me gustaría contarles dos cosas que estamos haciendo. Um, we're doing a lot of different projects. We have a lot of work, as you can see, um, there's a lot of work to be done in these, these areas. But I'm, I want to share two particular projects that we're doing. Estamos trabajando en una micro red 
en colaboración con, Green, con la Green Justice Coalition, ganamos 75 mil dólares para hacer un estudio sobre la mini red de energía en Chelsea. Um, we're working on a microgrid in collaboration with uh, the organization Green Justice Coalition. We won $75,000 to conduct a study on microgrids uh, in Chelsea. Esta mini red de energía estará conectada a la, a la red más grande de energía de la compañía. Uh, this microgrid would be connected to the much larger uh, energy grid of the electrical company. Los edificios que estén conectados a la, la micro red que esté conectada a los edificios, uh, perdón, es un poco complejo explicarlo. It's a little bit complicated <laughs> to explain it, but. Pero lo voy a intentar. But I'm going to try. Ok, los edificios estarán que estarán conectados producirán su propia energía renovable, esto ya sea solar o de viento. So the uh, buildings that would be connected to the grid would produce their own renewable energy, whether solar or wind. Podrán vender esta energía a la compañía grande. And then they could sell this energy to the larger company. Y por lo tanto, reducir los costos de energía. And in that way, reduce energy costs. Los edificios que estarán conectados a esta micro red serán escuelas públicas, hospitales, edificios municipales, vivienda pública y el mercado de frutas y verduras que, como les dije, eh, suministra alimento a Nueva Inglaterra y otras ciudades. Um, these buildings, the buildings that would be connected to the microgrid would be public schools, municipal buildings, hospitals, public housing, and the large produce market that I was mentioning earlier that uh, serves many communities in addition to New England. O sea, que estamos, estamos viendo más allá de lo local también. So we are looking... Um, beyond our local borders. Esto, en caso de desastres naturales, los residentes podrán ir a estos edificios que funcionarán como refugios. Also, if there's a natural disaster, the residents of the town could go to these buildings as um, shelter. Y evitará que pase lo que, pa lo que vivieron nuestros hermanos en Puerto Rico. And this would also prevent what our brothers in Puerto Rico have suffered. Otro tema que le quiero compartir, eh, desde Green Root estamos trabajando en la creación de una cooperativa de terreno con un grupo de mujeres migrantes latinas. Um, we're also at Green Roots, we're working on community land trusts to create these land trusts with a group of immigrant women, some Latinas who will live in Chelsea. La idea surgió por la gran crisis que hay en Chelsea y yo me atrevería a decir, es nacional, la crisis de vivienda. Um, the idea actually came from the crisis that Chelsea is going through and I would go as far as to say that this is a national crisis. Y principalmente para las personas de color, para las personas de bajo ingreso. And it's especially um, an important housing crisis for people of color and people of low income. Más del 70% de los residentes de Chelsea son inquilinos. Uh, more than 70% of the residents in Chelsea are tenants. Entonces hay una gran crisis en la ciudad porque es, por la gentrificación se está aumentando la renta y la gente está siendo desplazada. So there's this great crisis in Chelsea because now that it's being gentrified, people um, are seeing their rents go up and they have to be displaced to other communities. Los residentes y ese grupo entienden y reconocen que hay una necesidad de vivienda, pero también pelean por el derecho a la tierra y el derecho a la vivienda como uno de los derechos universales. Um, the people in that, um, in that community understand Um, what's going on and, and the crisis, the housing crisis that they're going through, but they also understand that they're fighting for land and for housing because it's one of their rights. Además de, constru de, de la lucha por el terreno, queremos construir vivienda, pero también queremos espacios para jardines comunitarios, espacios verdes. 
So in addition to uh, these land trusts, we also want land in order to build housing, community gardens, and green spaces. Gracias. Thank you. So I am from uh, an environmental justice organization that many of my sisters mentioned, uh, Alternatives for Community and Environment, ACE, uh, located in the Roxbury neighborhood. Uh, for 25 years, ACE has brought together families and communities to build their power to eradicate environmental racism, classism, and create healthy, sustainable communities, and achieve environmental justice. This mission is implemented through a community organizing membership model that engages and empowers people of color and low-income communities to identify solutions to their shared problems and to run successful campaigns in implementing these solutions. That process is facilitated through our programs. The Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, REAP, uh, the Tea Riders Union, TRUE, the Roxbury Campaign Committee, our membership program, environmental justice legal services, and our leadership in coalitions advancing environmental justice in Boston and in our state. Our green Green Roots uh, leadership development is grounded in a strongly held belief that those most impacted by injustice must lead us in resisting it and in creating solutions. To ensure we live this belief and are led by members, ACE provides formal and informal pathways for skills building, learning, and practice within all our organizing and programs. I would also like to mention that uh, women in our organization are at the core of the environmental justice work. Mm -hmm. It is an anchor uh, for the movement to generate smart ideas in this struggle. Women of color are A's involved in many aspects of the, the administration, fundraising, and organizing projects. I think there is uh, also a sense of acknowledgement in the, in the Roxbury neighborhood uh, that women are at the center of leading the youth development that also encourages the com community to participate in urban gardening, transportation, and health equity. Mm -hmm. We also believe in advancing ourselves with education so that we have all the necessary tools to plan the next steps in our sustainable work for better transparent policies. Our Tea Riders Union program organizes transit riders from low-income communities and communities of color to advocate for better service from the MBTA. In our public transit justice work, we also continue to collaborate with uh, Green Roots Chelsea with whom uh, we partnered to gain former Governor Patrick's support for Executive Order 552 and the MBTA's adoption of the Youth Pass program, mm -hmm. the Transportation for Massachusetts, a diverse coalition of over 70 partner and member organizations who advocate for transportation funds <coughs> to be spent fairly and wisely for transportation decisions that are transparent, accountable, and to ensure that our transportation system has sufficient resources to meet the Commonwealth's needs. Roxbury Environmental Empowerment Project, REAP, works with youth of color on a variety of environmental justice issues identified by youth as relevant to their lives. They know that a healthy and sustainable community is one that must not weather the storm and be resilient 
but also adapt and prepare for climate change. Mm -hmm. Essential to this work of adaptation is creating community-based alternative models, which enables residents to experiment, learn, and envision a sustainable future. REAP's Grow or Die campaign has successfully transformed four city-owned vacant lots into multi-use community gardens, mm -hmm. where residents build community and develop skills in food cultivation. In the next year, we will expand our vision and engage in efforts to promote long-term community land use and control. We believe this move toward community control through community land trust will protect against unwanted private development that drives the gentrification instead of supporting the stabilization of our neighborhoods. As an anchor organization of the Green Justice Coalition, <laughs> one of ACE's goal is to lead public education strategies to build legislator and public support for clean energy and environmental protection. ACE leads Green Justice Coalition's work on a landmark environmental justice bill, an act relative to environmental justice and toxic reduction in the Commonwealth, which would incorporate a definition of environmental justice community into the Massachusetts general laws. Required the development and implementation of environmental justice policies across state secretariats and limit the sitting of new industrial facilities that rely on toxic materials in environmental justice communities. Through our coalition work, ACE effectively pushed Massachusetts to enact its first statewide environmental justice policy, which created a legal structure necessary to combat and prevent the environmental overburdening of low-income communities and communities of color. We then advocated and negotiated approval of the state's three-year energy efficiency plans making visible the needs of low-income energy consumers and renters. In all of our environmental justice organizing and advocacy work, we bring an intersectional analysis mm -hmm. connecting clean energy and reduced greenhouse gas to greater equity and economic livelihood, development plans, housing and health outcomes, and legal and technical expertise. Neighborhoods that have seen decades of public and private disinvestment, mm -hmm. environmental degradation, and racist segregation are now being flooded with an influx of new capital, new development, and new residents. A large part of this problem is an over-reliance on the private sector and a neoliberal agenda to drive urban development. The public sector sees the, its role as facilitating and supporting private development through public policy and spending. There is currently no greater threat to Roxbury's cultural and economic health than gentrification and the risk of further displacement. Mm -hmm. The Roxbury Campaign Committee is educating and organizing Roxbury residents around the Boston Planning and Development Agency. The planning process and development plans to ensure sustainable and equitable community <laughs> development in our neighborhoods. And our membership program provides a space for our constituents to identify problems and implement solutions. Our movement affirms the rights of all people to public policy that is free from any form of discrimination, to participate as equal partners at every level of decision making, and for communities to not be subject to environmental extraction. 
This movement more broadly affirms the rights of communities not to be subject to extraction that also includes culture and the local economy. In transitioning from an extractive to a just economy, municipalities, developers, and communities must work to preserve and enhance local cultural and economic assets. Thank you. Hello. Okay, so um, we're going to shift gears a little bit. I am an environmental health, public health scientist. And so if we view many of the environmental and social justice problems that um, my, uh, my colleagues have talked about today as nails, my, you know, one of my main hammers is the scientific method. And I'm probably more comfortable talking in the language of data and statistical models than I am storytelling. So I'm actively resisting the urge of showing you lots of graphs and data, <laughs> uh, which is a big thing. And um, rather sharing with you, um, you know, how I try to uh, implement this dual goal of conducting rigorous, innovative science um, that actively addresses public health problems and that actively is used to promote health protective policies and um, support decision making, whether that's on the local or national level. Um, as Ajanta mentioned, um, I, um, you know, I, I seek to advance, make advancements in science policy and clinical practice um, to help secure environmental justice and improve, um, unfortunately, the growing inequalities in health, um, particularly in our country. We're really moving in the wrong direction. Um, um, instead of, you know, improving things, um, even though we've been documenting a lot of these health disparities uh, for many years, many decades. Um, for the past 15 years, I've worked alongside various community organizations using the scientific method to both document and validate community concerns. I've addressed um, health risk from various forms of environmental degradation, ranging from um, poor indoor air, air quality in public housing to uh, ambient air pollution from oil refineries and other polluting industries, metal-laden mine waste at toxic Superfund sites on Native American reservations, and most recently, toxic chemicals in beauty products marketed to women of color. Uh, I'm gonna share a few examples from my own research, um, and you'll probably see some examples of scaling of, you know, of issues um, and, um, and the evolution of my own work, which has been greatly influenced by listening to community members, listening to collaborators, also listening to the data, um, and being willing to uh, tr try new things. Um, so, uh, the first example I want to share with you um, comes from a community-based participatory study <laughs> called the California Household Exposure Study. Um, this study was done um, in collaboration with several universities and uh, two community-based organizations, including an EJ organization called Communities for a Better Environment in, um, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the goal of the study, um, it was done in Northern California, and our goal and w our, our main point was to compare indoor and outdoor air pollution exposures between Richmond, a neighborhood bordering an oil refinery, and Bolinas, a rural neighborhood that served as a regional comparison. Uh, something that was unique about this project was uh, we had many different types of goals. So our scientific goal um, and this was an, an, a, a project that was funded by the National Institutes of Health. So our scientific goal was to characterize cumulative impacts of various um, pollution sources in an environmental justice community, uh, which we defined as an area of low income or ethnic minority residents who are disproportionately affected by pollution. We did this by measuring numerous pollutants and assessing differences with homes in non-EJ communities. In addition to our scientific goals, we also had educational and policy goals. Our educational goals were to inform community members about their air quality and strategies for exposure reduction. Um, and
and, uh, and then our, one of our main policy goals was actually to help our advocacy partners inform local decisions about the oil refinery. So those policy goals were derived in collaboration um, with our advocacy partners. And so to help facilitate those policy goals, uh, we did a couple of things. One, we actively reported the results back to the community in various different ways. Too often scientists come into these communities, collect data, and then, and then leave. Um, there's never that return back. Um, we held community events with uh, Spanish language interpreters and childcare where uh, we gave the results back to the community in uh, ways that were culturally appropriate, um, you know, at the appropriate educational level, which really also pushed us to find new ways to visualize and communicate our data. Um, we also reported individuals' environmental exposure results back to them if they had requested that information. And at that time, that was also very novel because um, often people think, well, if there aren't clear health and safety thresholds, perhaps you know, reporting the data back will only create anxiety or you know, perhaps community members won't know how to in interpret that information. Uh, but we decided we would help them in that interpretation process and you know, we, would, we would let them make some of those decisions um, for themselves. Um, so these intentional efforts um, help to create a dialogue and exchange with the local community. And it also led to a shared ownership of the data. Um, as a result, our community-based organization partner presented the data to the Richmond City Council and Planning Commission and argued in court for a cumulative impacts assessment to be included in the oil refinery permit applications. And that was an approach that was central to our research. Um, this advocacy resulted in a legal victory that actually blocked the expansion of the oil refinery. Uh, so we saw that as a, as a big uh, win for, uh, for public health. Um, another kind of big, I guess, lesson or uh, component of this project was uh, the diversity of our scientific team. I think it also helped to change how <laughs> the community viewed scientists and science. Uh, many of communities of color carry a distrust of science and medicine, mm -hmm. in part because uh, there's been historical exploitations of these communities by the scientific enterprise, but also because science and medicine um, are still commonly used to discredit community knowledge and experience. Uh, you know, I did a lot of the reporting back of the results um, to the community, and I probably for many of them, I was the first woman of color scientist that many of them had ever met. And I think that brings up an important issue for this panel, which you know, was very intentionally created to lift up voices of women of color about why diversity and inclusion are important, <laughs> because it really does <laughs> impact what research questions are asked, the methods they are, you know, that are used to answer them, as well as whose perspectives and voices um, are, are included. Um, another side of this, of this, of that, another kind of dimension of the work that came out of that same community-based participatory research project um, involved um, more work on toxics at the at the state and um, federal level. So, another one of our policy goals um, was to impact state and federal policies regarding endocrine-disrupting compounds in consumer products. So, endocrine-disrupting chemicals are substances that are um, often are man-made industrial chemicals. Um, they can interfere with how hormones behave in our body, even at lo low levels. Um, many of these chemicals are widely used in consumer products and consequently are ubiquitous in our everyday environments as well as in our bodies. So in, the ca in this California household exposure study, uh, we, um, you know, we looked at a, a lot of chemicals that may have come from you know, vehicular exhaust or the oil refinery, but we also measured a wide range of these EDCs. <laughs> and we found very high levels of PBDE flame retardants in all of the California homes. And this was, uh, they were some of the highest levels um, in the world. And so this was kind of a surprising finding, but we kind of, we kind of followed the data. And, um, and kind of the backstory on these flame retardants are, are quite interesting. So 
beginning in the 1950s and 60s, um, we started seeing a big uptick in um, household fires and um, fire-related injuries and even death. And it was largely because smoking rates were going up, lots of people were smoking indoors, often falling asleep with half-lit cigarettes. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we were having more consumer products like furniture being made from uh, petrochemical byproducts like polyurethane foam. So there was like this, you know, kind of um, perfect storm of more smoking and highly flammable products. Well, um, the tobacco industry was very clever because they uh, kind of very cleverly shifted the focus from the cigarettes, which was really the main problem, to the couches. And they're like, those are the things we have to fix. Uh, so, um, you know, it was a well-intentioned, um, you know, intervention, but furniture makers started treating furniture with these chemical flame retardants, which they just mixed into the foam. And they, they thought they were inert, and they thought they were staying in the products. Well, lo and behold, they weren't inert. They were actually neurotoxicants, and they weren't staying in the furniture. They were actually migrating out of our products into our dust and into our air. Mm -hmm. uh, so we found, you know, like jump forward 30 or 40 years, we, you know, people had started detecting them in breast milk, in, in house dust, and uh, we found these very high levels in California homes. And um, we hypothesized that it was the unintended result of the very unique and stringent um, fire safety standards that were unique to California. So they said that all furniture uh, must be able to withstand an open flame for 30 seconds. And so the way that most furniture makers did this was by adding these flame retardants. And uh, so we, we wanted to see, well, would we see the same thing um, in, in people's bodies? And so we did it several other studies, and we actually found that um, low-income, racially diverse pregnant women in California had some of the high, world's highest levels of these PBD flame retardants in their bodies. And remember, these are um, established neurotoxic, neurotoxicants um, based on studies in cells and animals and even, and even humans. So around this time the, this research was published, California policymakers um, started considering a change to the state's fire safety standards. Uh, I happened to be doing a postdoc in California at that time. Uh, so I testified in front of the California legislator um, and also started writing commentaries to highlight the disproportionate burden of chemical flame retardants among low-income communities of color. And this was, uh, this, you know, it was important to highlight these disproportionate impacts, but it was also important for kind of re for, for building coalitions. Uh, because up until that point, the chemical industry had really tried to say, you know, oh, this is like green legislation that only the enviro groups wanted. And, you know, um, and, and they actually tried to, to kind of pit, pit the enviros you know, against some of the um, EJ and social justice groups because still low-income communities of color were, were dying more from um, kind of ho household fires. Um, so kind of during this time too, um, new data was coming, uh, was kind of being revealed that uh, these flame retardants really weren't that effective in, in addressing the problem. Uh, so we kind of, we started writing about how, you know, you should really think about uh, this fire safety standard, not just as an environmental standard, but really as social policies. Because we know a lot of these communities already face so many barriers to healthy growth and development. So here's a chance to prevent, you know, uh, exposure to a no known neurotoxicant. And um, over time, this body of work um, has helped to change our approach to fire safety at both the state and federal level. Uh, to ensure adequate fire safety without the use of hazardous chemicals. So now I would just want to share one last example um, where my work is getting increasingly, I would say, molecular. I'm becoming more interested in really trying to understand how um, <coughs> structural racism and other systemic forces really become biologically embedded um, at the molecular and cellular level mm -hmm. uh, to affect health and to also affect the health of um, future uh, generations. And uh, some of this work really lies at the intersection of environmental justice but also reproductive justice because 
um, a lot of it is really about um, you know the right of women to uh, control their own bodies and also to have control over their ability to have a healthy pregnancy and uh, to you know be able to raise their families in uh, healthy and safe environments. Mm -hmm. And um, you know some of the work, th some of this work has been getting a lot of attention in the media recently. You know, just thinking about Black women's health and just the, you know really disturbing disparity of around how many black women are dying in childbirth uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at my own city of DC, one of, one of the most wealthy cities in this country, and our maternal mortality rate is twice the national average. Uh, there's whole wards of DC that, um, that lack a maternity ward, uh, which to me is um, completely unacceptable in 2018 um, in USA. So, um, right, so I'm trying to connect structural racism and how it may become biologically embedded <laughs> to impact reproductive health. <coughs> and, um, and so, right, so, um, you know, w one way we're doing that is um, we're starting to look at the health repercussions of toxic chemicals and beauty products through an EJ lens, mm -hmm. something we refer to as the environmental injustice of beauty. Um, beauty product use is an understudied source of environmental chemical exposures. Um, some of these products can include reproductive and developmental toxicants such as phthalates and heavy metals. Um, however, disclosure requirements are limited and inconsistent. Um, compared with white women, women of color have higher levels of beauty product related environmental chemicals in their bodies. And this is independent of socioeconomic status. So it can't be explained by socioeconomic status alone. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, so it can't be explained by class. Um, even small exposures to these toxic chemicals during critical periods of development, such as pregnancy, can trigger adverse health consequences um, on fertility, on pregnancy, on brain development, and even cancer. Um, mass distributions of images that idealize whiteness can influence sales of hair straighteners, skin lighteners, and odor masking products. And racial discrimination based on European beauty norms can lead to internalized racism, body shame, and skin tone dissatisfaction. Factors that can influence product use um, to right, achieve these idealized beauty norms. Uh, so we are, starting to look at beauty product use as one way that structural discrimination may become biologically embedded. Um, and in one future project or upcoming project, we're actually gonna be working with a multidisciplinary team of public health scientists, social scientists, as well as grassroots EJRJ organizations uh, to identify links between beauty product use and um, racial ethnic differences in breast cancer uh, through community-based surveys and chemical product testing. Um, in general, we're trying to use kind of sophisticated, emerging uh, biological and molecular tools uh, with, you know, nuanced um, social structural frameworks to, you know, move beyond just looking at uh, race as a, this dichotomous biological construct to one that's really looking at it more as a social construct and really focusing on racism in addition to just, to just race. So, um, and, um, and all of this research, I should say, has been a great opportunity to train uh, the next generation of women of color scientists um, and, and, and to get them engaged in, into this work. Um, so it's kind of new models of, um, <laughs> you know, not only new disease models, but new ways of, uh, of creating, creating knowledge. Um, and I just wanna end by saying that um, even though I often speak in the language of data and numbers, good science alone is not enough to create social change. Um, I'm equally committed to translating and disseminating the science uh, for public health policy and practice. Um, so, um, you know, so I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much for those incredible presentations. Um, 
I just want to open the floor up. You guys have all been here listening, so I'm sure you have lots of questions. Um, I have questions of my own, but I think let's start with yours. Yeah. hopes for the uh, the project how, how do you see this evolving well that's a really great question thank you I mean I, I uh, um, you know I'm, I'm very interested in uh, the power of stories and the power of culture and how we talk about uh, change that is led by people who are directly impacted I'm also very interested in black women's stories black women as leaders, black women as uh, innovators and thinkers and scientists. Um, and, and I just feel like that um, black people's relationship to land because of the legacy of enslavement, um, that that, you know, that that, you know, n that connection is really, you know, and analyzing some of the you know, why that connection is really important in terms of our environmental activism. So I, I you know, I, I, I think, and, and I love gardening, gardening, and I have lots of black women in my life who garden, and I love them all, and I learn <laughs> something from all of them. And I think that just gardening are really interesting stories. They're ways of telling stories about who we are and where we come from. Uh, and that's powerful to me. So I don't know if that's a direct answer to your question, but uh, I, I think there's a lot to learn from uh, black women environmental leaders that we don't know, uh, and I'm interested in those stories being uplifted. Can you introduce yourself, actually, before you ask your question? <laughs> <laughs> Sit on the back of this couch. I'm, oh. I'm Amelia, I'm a junior at the college, um, and I wanna say thank you to all of you guys. This has been a really fascinating panel. Um, my question is about uh, the future, I guess. We've heard a lot about the need for adaptation to climate uh, change on both macro and micro levels, but I'm wondering what your thoughts are about how communities can adapt in terms of transforming themselves and whether environmental justice is also a project of transforming communities to tackle the future? Question mark. I think that's addressed to any of you, maybe. Um, I guess a couple of things come up for me when I hear that question, I think. Um, <laughs> Climate resiliency, uh, the sort of that term has been uh, coming up a lot in philanthropic spaces and also in spaces of organizing. And I think that, you know, one of the lessons that was learned from Hurricane Sandy, from Katrina, um, that I think is important is to really, is to understand that our neighbors and our communities are also first responders. And so part of how communities are able to adapt is by uh, continuing to build relationships with each other. And, um, you know, that is, that sounds, you know, sort of slow and, but it is the thing that, that saves people in those moments is their uh, ability to be, to be rescued, to be recognized and to be connected to, um, to a social network. And so I think adaptation and resiliency is about, you know, the sort of physical infrastructure that gives people, you know, a few more hours to get to a safe place. Uh, but it is also about what are the, um, what are the ways in which we need to have policies that support and strengthen communities, which is one of the reasons why gentrification and displacement is such a huge threat to communities that are already uh, going to be less likely to be able to be resilient because people are moving away from those social networks. I think it's also a reason why um, jobs and economic policies are really important uh, because, you know, 
the ways in which people have to have multiple jobs. So, so they're not at home, you know, being able to be in those social spaces because they have to work to pay their rent. Um, and so I think all of those things are really linked together. And the environmental justice framework, I think, provides um, analysis of how those different um, how the, those different problems are intersected and how we can think about solutions. I, if I yeah, can just yeah. add, I, I, and I also would just say that communities of color have always adapted. And you don't survive 400 plus years of oppression and not have strategies for adapting. And so I feel like one of our opportunities is to learn from what people have always done and that we don't always take ideas from, as Ami's pointing out in her work, that you don't always lead with the ideas that comes from outside of the, out of the community. That you're actually engaging the community on what they know already. And that becomes part of the strategy that we all value. So we've always adapted. Everyone has always adapted. And of course we always have to, you know, be, be, At attentive to what's emerging, but we've always adapted. So this idea, this narrative about, you know, uh, how do we, you know, what do people need to do? What have people always done that we can learn from and invest in those strategies and to actually support them? <laughs> Thanks. Um, thank you very much. This is a great, I just, I'm loving hearing about all of your work. Um, I was wondering, oh, my name is Kaya. Um, I'm an anthropologist as well. Um, I was wondering if you could say a little bit more, sort of all of you about, I feel like I heard you all are doing sort of really intersectional work and I feel like I heard a lot about sort of the intersections of environmental justice, housing justice, transit justice. Um, and I'm wondering if you could just say more about where criminal justice fits into that, sort of how you see your work intersecting with um, mass incarceration with sort of the effects of that on the communities that you work in um, and where you sort of see the opportunities for working on that. Anyone? I have a lot to say on that. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, so in Roxbury, uh, you probably know that um, there are two police stations. Um, it is one of uh, environmental concerns too. If you look around, you see um, a lot of elderly people, not too many young people. Um, also, um, on top of that, uh, some of the problems we identified in mass incarceration was uh, within mass incarceration itself, it is, there is a form of environmental justice problem there. Uh, in some of the massage sets, uh, uh, facilities that, <laughs> that are hosting uh, uh, a lot of incarcerated uh, people of color. Uh, we identified that there is a, contam a contaminated water within the facility and uh, we are working with um, some uh, health uh, expertise to identify and what it means. So um, if you see environmental justice, the scope goes on and uh, for ACE or any environmental justice community that uh, we have been working, the, the shape and the form of the struggle has been changing. Um, we, we may have a few uh, successes but definitely in the past 20 years, they have changed. Uh, they have become more complicated structurally. Mm -hmm. So um, seeing the environmental justice and uh, the criminal justice, uh, they are all connected. 
Um, so for our uh, organizing work would be to see the structural problems, just than saying, oh, this is people of color, so they are impacted by this. But it's much deeper than that. Uh, so uh, the movement of uh, Black Lives Matter uh, is just not an open air, uh, some type of, uh, so it has been around for many, many years, uh, as you can imagine, but within a struggle, there's another struggle. That's what I'm trying to say. And there's a lot of work to be done, definitely. But finding those solutions is uh, what we should focus on because it seems sometimes it's endless. Uh, but yeah, if anyone wants to add on that. <laughs> Just a, a, I mean, and sometimes we, we know the solutions, right? But it's about implementing basic solutions, right? So take, take the example of lead, right? We, 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 we know the health effects of lead. We, we know how to fix that problem, whether it's lead in water or lead in, in lead paint. And yet, uh, you know, in some ways lead, like the problem of uh, like getting blood lead levels down is considered a public health victory, but really, uh, it's been concentrated uh, globally among poor people and it, you know, in, in this country and in EJ communities. And we know that lead exposures in children, <coughs> you know, they're, they're irreversible. And they also, you know, they affect brain development, but they, they may also be, uh, you know, increasing violent behavior and things linked to, you know, so then almost predisposing people to, you know, get into the criminal justice system. So in that way, it some of these um, environmental concerns are perpetuating these cycles. And in, in the case of lead, um, we don't have to go out and hunt for a solution. We, we, we actually know them pretty well, you know. So it's, it's about just <coughs> having the political will to implement what we know. Me gustaría agregar algo. I would like to add something. Um, bueno, para, para nosotras, para mí, eh, está totalmente relacionada la justicia eh, criminal. Um, porque ¿quiénes son los cuerpos? ¿Quiénes son los cuerpos que viven en las comunidades de justicia ambiental? ¿Quiénes somos? Somos las personas de color, somos, las, somos los migrantes, somos las comunidades negras. Y son esos cuerpos que están siendo criminalizados. Uno... Eh, por ser personas negras, todos los prejuicios que hay, pero también porque somos migrantes. Um, you know, I think that criminal justice and um, environmental justice are linked because when you look at all of the bodies that live in our communities, who are these bodies? Who are these people? And it's people of color, immigrants, black communities. And these are the very communities that are being criminalized because, specifically because they're black and there's this prejudice um, behind being black or a person of color or a person that's an immigrant. Um, en la comunidad donde yo vivo, en la ciudad, el 65% es comunidad latina. Y hay muchos jóvenes que están siendo encarcelados. Um, in my community where I live, 65% are Latinos, and I see that a lot of young people are being incarcerated. Y estos jóvenes también son negros porque los Latinos, la etnia Latina es muy diversa. Um, and these uh, young people are also black because even though we're Latinos, Latinos are very diverse, and so there are also, um, uh, you know, black Latinos. Y lo más reciente con este presidente actual son las leyes y las políticas antimigrantes que está aplicando y que nuestra comunidad está sufriendo. No solo está encarcelando a la gente, pero también las está deportando. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the current administration that we have, um, they're implementing anti-immigrant laws that our communities are suffering through. And it's not only our communities that are being incarcerated, but they're also being deported. 
está separando a las comunidades y para muchas de las comunidades ser deportada implica morir porque justamente ha migrado aquí porque ha escapado de la violencia. You know, um, the, these policies are separating our communities and for a lot of our communities to be deported means to die because when they arrived here they were able to escape that violent situation. <laughs> Entonces, cuando hablamos de justicia ambiental, hablamos de justicia criminal, hablamos de, de, de derechos humanos. No solo estamos hablando del derecho a tener un aire limpio, estamos hablando del derecho a vivir, a tener una vida con calidad. Um, you know, when we talk about environmental justice, we are also talking about criminal justice and all sorts of types of, of justice, human rights, just basic human rights. It's not only about having clean air, but ra rather having the right to live and to have a life of quality. Thank you. From the same couch up front. Um, hi, I'm Shalonda Baker, and I'm a professor of law and public policy at Northeastern, so it's good to see you, uh, Timbit, here. Um, So one of the successes of the environmental justice movement has also been its downfall, right? In, in terms of the gentrification that we see in communities that have been quote unquote cleaned up and are now more inhabitable <laughs> um, and safer. So uh, I see environmental justice as a really useful framework and a theoretical tool to sort of identify problems and then remediate. Um, but I think we're in this really unique moment with the just transition, which many of you have mentioned, Um, to look at the different intersections between gentrification and among climate justice and environmental justice as well, particularly in some of the energy innovations that some of you mentioned. Um, and I was just wondering more concretely about the particular policy opportunities to link the gentrification piece and the sort of threats to the home with innovations around energy and energy democracy. I know that was mentioned by um, Jennifer and also Kalila. And so um, I don't know if, there are anything, if there's anything happening locally in Boston around sort of home security and security of land um, that could allow for this just transition to happen that doesn't further jeopardize the <coughs> communities that you know, are already at risk of losing their homes. Um, I mean, I would say that I think I wouldn't say that people are necessarily already making those links, but hopefully we'll be there soon. But uh, a couple of folks have mentioned the idea of a, a community land trust. And so um, Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative convenes the Greater Boston Land Trust Network, which includes Green Roots and ACE and several other community organizations across the Boston area who've sort of combined forces to try to push more broadly the land trust movement. So some of those folks have, um, are just starting land trusts, so they're in the process of trying to actually acquire the land, which is particularly challenging uh, in the case of Chinatown, for example. Um, one, that there's not a lot of vacant land, but then, you know, okay, you can afford to buy, you know, a triple-decker for, I don't know, $700,000 or something, let's say, but then, you know, you can't, uh, you don't have enough resources to keep it affordable for the tenants that are in there. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the things that they are trying to push for um, is dollars from the Community Preservation Act. Mm -hmm. So this was a mm -hmm. policy that Boston passed last year um, mm -hmm. that allows access for resources for affordable housing, green space, and historic preservation. So I think that's one opportunity also talking with the city about um, prioritizing land for disbursement to land trusts so there are still some smaller parcels of land in the city of boston particularly in roxbury dorchester mattapan so how do we prioritize uh, those th th that public resources going for the public good um, And there have been examples of that recently with Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative. So uh, we acquired a commercial property in Upham's Corner, um, one of the largest commercial properties that the land trust had ever acquired. And so it will, um, it is, it's design and planning 
is being discussed as a part of the larger Uplands Corner planning process. What I haven't see, seen people do just yet is to sort of think about what are the opportunities for energy efficiency or, or you know, a connection mm -hmm. on the land that we do have. Mm -hmm. um, I think in part because people are just like, the land is so expensive, how do we even just uh, kind of get it? But um, <laughs> there is uh, there's also kind of simultaneously a push for um, around in sort of codification of um, climate resilient, um, basically crime, climate resilient policies around the building codes within the city of Boston. So a lot of the things that folks are doing, developers are doing are, um, they're not required to do those things. And so perhaps there's an opportunity to think about not only should this land be used for the public good, which you know we've defined broadly as doing affordable housing, but what are the opportunities to build in a more um, sustainable and resilient kind of way by looking at the building code? So yeah, those are a, a couple of things that that folks are talking about. You know, I've also um, heard about policies for when um, subsidized housing is redeveloped to push for um, upgrading of like air conditioning within those units because we know that especially for communities that are away from the coast uh, where there's just a lot of concrete mm. um, heat is, a, is one of the ways that people are going to be suffering um, and probably dying, you know, if they don't have access to cooling centers. Mm -hmm. So can I just, um, so does that mean that the, because you, you guys, several of you talked about um, the land trust and also about the microgrid. So is there no link between the land trust and the microgrid? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying? I'm saying it's really just getting started. So the, so the, <laughs> the microgrid project, I think the award for that came like earlier this year. Okay. Um, and so the land trust that DSNI has, for example, you know, has been around for a couple of decades. So some new things are being introduced into the conversation because there are environmental justice organizations at the table, like ACE and Green Roots. But you know, I would say within the past like six to eight months, people are beginning to mm -hmm. explore that. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Pua Brown, I'm a senior. Um, thank you all for coming and for your contributions and all your work, it's really amazing. Um, I just, I'm environmental science and public policy at Harvard and I just finished my thesis on um, food sovereignty <laughs> <laughs> um, in traditional Hawaiian agriculture um, in the context of the global food system but really focusing on water rights and um, in the public trust doctrine and um, restorative environmental justice. And so kind of that sort of brings in what you were saying about communities um, sort of uplifting themselves, sort of giving them the resources, um, whether it's environmental resources or economic resources to, um, to make the change that they seek. Um, and so I guess, and I, I took um, Professor Rumanian's class last semester and it was a huge inspiration um, in clarifying all these thoughts and one of the things that just kept coming up, like so many of these themes were throughout my thesis, but those, uh, the intersectionality of environmental justice and kind of like how, um, like creating a world uh, of like a, imagining alternative futures in a world of shared values. And um, I really think that there's um, a huge potential in terms of like indigenous rights mm -hmm. and environmental justice rhetoric and also restorative environmental justice for all you know, marginalized communities. And so I was wondering if you guys had um, more to say about that. Well, wh one thing, I uh, thank you very much and for just even like lifting up these, this future of where we have shared values. Um, I, you know, I think that part of the power of storytelling is that, and then hearing each other's stories, is that we start to build empathy for each other. And I, I feel like that's a really undervalued facilitator of how we might start to create, create equity um, uh, and, and, and justice. And so, you know, I think that the, when we hear stories and we start to make connections between 
our histories and understanding that a lot of what we're dealing with has been set up. There's a historical precedent set in motion by certain laws and policies uh, that sort of got us where we are today. And so, you know, I think that, you know, it, it, it's that larger ecosystem of what you're saying is, you know, how do we uh, lift up what is, you know, indigenous rights, what is, you know, what we, the community knowledge that we hold. Um, I, you know, I think that one thing, one point that I'm taking away just from your own reflection, I think it's going to take an intersection of all of those different strategies. And I think that this, the strategy around policy, I think that is an area where we're playing a little bit of catch up and we have to really engage our folks on what are the policies on the books right now that need to be changed that are causing harm that many of us really don't know that much about. Uh, and we have to politicize folks about policies and how we can change policies. And so I feel like that's, a, that's an area, whether it's around land usage or energy, and you know, if I could just lift up a couple of things that some of our grantees are doing. Um, we had a grantee network in Rhode Island of immigrant workers that just passed legislation at the state level in Rhode Island that recognizes worker-owned cooperatives. That had not been on, you know, recognized in the state of Rhode Island, worker-owned cooperatives as businesses which means that they, maybe they can get some state funding to start, but that's a game changer, right, for people. Or um, even thinking about the, carcer the incarceration, that there was a group of young people that passed the CSA Act in Providence around police brutality and mandating that the police department keep data on who they, who they stop and why, because they were learning that young people had these, um, after being, having interactions with the police, that they, their names are in these gang databases, and they had no idea why, you know? And so parents didn't know, the youth didn't know, they'd go to apply for jobs and programs, and then these, these records would come up. And it's like, how the hell did they get in there? And they'd have these interactions with the police, and the police were putting their names in the database, you know? So they just passed a law that changes that where the police have to be transparent about what they're doing when they interact with youth of color. So this is what I'm saying. This is the kind of like multi-strategy policy level engagement that we have to be like on top of. Um, so I think that that's one of the opportunities that we have. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really enjoyed the um, conversation on different scales, you know. I, my question emerges out of like some of the things around the environmental justice and moving more to what Ami was talking around, science mm -hmm. and production of knowledge on a, a scientific level. And I wanted to raise, like, I mean, that's my first question. How do you really make those connections more explicit? Because most of the time when we think from environmental justice, immediately that knowledge is degraded as being less, you know, scientific, less, you know, knowledgeable or less insightful about innovation and all that stuff. Uh, so I think it may be interesting to see how do we have that conversation that it doesn't really become us versus them. You know, because for instance, I am, I, by the way, I didn't introduce myself, I'm Naga Fengelu, I teach in Toronto. I mean, I sent some of my students to go into one of the communities, which is like a kind of Chelsea, and it was, they were shocked how the corporations have come in mm -hmm. and making demands and claims on the indigenous land in order to build their own power plants there. Mm -hmm. You know, while the indigenous people have been struggling for more than 40 years in this particular area, to really say we don't want power plants because mm -hmm. it's contaminating our waters, it's destroying our lives, cancer rate is higher than any other community. So I'm wondering if there is a way of speaking to that kind of you know, gap, if you will. You know? So that's my first question. My second question, because I'm also an international relations professor, 
I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, one of the big issues that you guys brought up about energy and migration, I mean, we saw uh, Donald Trump just attacked Syria, yep. and one of the major issues there is foreign policy and militarization. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just wanted to throw that out because I think one of the major issues is like a lot of the resources, public resources end up going to militarization, yep. you know, and basically stealing other people's like lo land and energy resources. So <coughs> it's, it's kind of how do we make that global connection more explicit, you know? And I think in a way we can speak about America as being so isolated and, you know, the big empire, <laughs> you know, can kill anybody everywhere. But I think it may be important <laughs> for us to start thinking, especially around migration, what are those connections? Because when you are displacing refugees, they're coming here, you know, perhaps, uh, or Europe, you know, but with what implications on environmental issues and, you know, scientific approaches to understanding, you know, the environmental disruption. Thank you. Sure, uh, I can start. I mean, I, I, I think your point is uh, <laughs> well taken about the production of knowledge and you know, how to engage communities and, and to lift up their knowledge, especially to, you know, protect their environment, protect their rights. And I mean, I think conversations like this are, are very important. And, you know, I think it starts with developing trust among different people, right? Investing in these relationships. Um, you know, I mean, I think everything starts with, 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 with relationships. I mean, that gets back to what Trina was saying, right? And especially relationships across difference. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, you know, I mean, I think, and then once you have those relationships, to be creative about, about what you produce and also what language you, what the different languages you can use in your production and also the different types of output, right? So language is being anything from English to indigenous languages to, uh, you know, more scientific, quantitative language to like something that's very much constructed to move policy, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. in and of itself yeah. its own language or, you know, a language mm -hmm. that's uh, very much constructed to increase everybody's awareness of a problem, which often moves policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So really thinking about like, in a sense, I think to create change, a lot of us have to become like almost think bilingually, but mm -hmm. like, you know, not necessarily, you yeah. know, thinking about language, in, in, you know, in, in a looser term. So, mm -hmm. you know, because like, you know, I, I think about the community-based, you know, community-based partnerships can take many different forms. Uh, but I think that the best ones kind of recognize the fact that different stakeholders have different needs. And, you know, I, ideally we'd be, we'd be trying to, address some of these. But, um, you know, I, I mean, I, well, kind of going back to your point about moving policy, I mean, two things. I, I've started to get more into that, and it is a very kind of different way of thinking and a, a different way of translating information and also asking very specific questions that may be different than sometimes the most pressing questions for the scientific community. But then I think the other elephant in the room is, you know, like, what is our likelihood of changing policy for the better on the federal landscape in the next few years, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> so even if that's what we need to do, if you look at in the space of human rights, environment, public health, like likely the only thing, if anything that's happening is, is going, you know, strikingly in the wrong direction. And so, you know, what are the strategies um, in, in the face of that, that big elephant in the room? Mm -hmm. But that, that also speaks to different levels of government, right? Right. So but it's not it's that important. all the levels of government line up neatly, right? So you've got California, which is at war with the federal government right now. Yeah. So how does, so it's not just about tr figuring out the language of policy and how to navigate the world of policy, but at what level of state, you know, yeah. you sort of, you know, uh, you pitch your claims, right? Mm -hmm. And you can even use sort of tensions between different levels mm -hmm. of government to your advantage. I mean, I don't know if, I mean, I, I heard a lot about the municipal level and mm -hmm. that level of government having a little more give, right? That it's a much more kind of, there, there, there's sort of possibilities for participation 
uh, there's, there's possibilities to sort of lay claim to policy, right, as, as a right. Yeah. I don't know whether it's that easy to do at the federal level. Um, <laughs> we're all like, so many things to say. I think, um, I think you're right. You know, a lot of us are mostly contesting for power at the municipal level because that is where, um, it's a level that our, our base understands and can vision around. And at the same time, I also believe that this is part of the reason why I was talking about this like tenure agenda. Mm. So, you know, part of the reason, or, or we're, I should say, we're not in this position as a country because of this one election, yeah. right? So there were, you know, a series of, a series of, you know, decisions and, you know, power strategies that folks had been planning decades before this moment that happened to come to fruition, maybe by, act, you know, who knows, just, a, you know, a sort of a, a a cloud of, of circumstances brought us to that. And so I think for me, that is that means that we, our side, needs to also be doing that kind of level of planning and strategy. Not that it's easy, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. but, and so not only, and what the hard part is, not only being able to say what we don't want, but really doing the hard work to vision about yeah. what does it look like when we're gonna govern and mm -hmm. what, how do we actually want these systems transformed? And um, I think that's the part that we have to really begin you know, thinking and strategizing yeah. about and unfortunately understanding and grappling with the fact that during this period there's going to be a lot of harm. Mm -hmm. That is just inevitable and so how can we also strengthen our practices for for healing with each other and dealing with the multitudes of, of and many faceted ways that trauma is going to be continuing yeah. to attack our folks and is already is already here, but um, yeah, I think we have to do you know longer term visioning and planning. Does anyone want to answer the militarism question? Yeah, just for the end. <laughs> Hay algo que me hizo eco en lo que mencionaste, fue la última parte de la interconexión que hay entre lo que pasa aquí, pero también lo que pasa en otros países. Um, something that was very interesting about what you had mentioned was that inter, um, intersection between what is happening here and also what is happening in other countries. Creo que cuando hablamos de justicia ambiental tenemos que hablar intrínsecamente de capitalismo, de este sistema económico que nos está fregando la vida. I think that um, when we talk about environmental justice, we also have to talk about capitalism and the economic system that we have that is quite frankly destroying our lives. In Latin America, voy a hablar de ese contexto que es lo que más es lo más cercano a mi experiencia. Hemos sufrido por muchísimas, bueno, desde la colonización. Eh, el extractivismo, el extractivismo de nuestros, nuestros recursos naturales. Um, you know, I'm going to talk about Latin America because that's what <laughs> has been my experience and that's what I'm most knowledgeable about. But we have suffered. We have suffered for a very long time um, ever since the colonialism um, of extractivism. Y ahora estamos viviendo lo que es el capitalismo. And now we're living through capitalism. ¿Qué conexión tiene eso? La, lo económico con el ambiente está totalmente conectado. And so what connections do we see there between everything that is economic and the environment? And it's completely connected. Porque son las compañías, las grandes compañías que van a nuestros países y que sacan toda la riqueza, que explotan los recursos naturales. And it's these large corporations that go to our countries and take our, um, mm -hmm. our uh, that just exploit our natural resources. Que desplazan a pueblos indígenas, que desplazan a todo lo que hay en el paso, a todo lo que tiene, a todo el, el, 
contaminan los ríos, sacan todos los materiales preciosos. Este sistema es el que está haciendo eso y que a la vez produce cambios en el ambiente. You know, um, uh, these major corporations, by exploiting our natural resources, are displacing indigenous groups, are displacing basically everything that gets in their way. They're contaminating rivers, they're taking our precious goods, and it's exactly <laughs> this system that is causing this climate change. Y eso lo hacen allá y lo hacen aquí. And they do it there and they do it here. Entonces, conectando eso, porque todo está interconectado, cuando hablamos de migración y de la gente pobre centroamericana, chusma, que entra a Estados Unidos, no vemos ese tema. No vemos que están sacando nuestros recursos que nos están empobreciendo. Mm -hmm. Um, so when you talk about these um, systems and how they're connected, we also have to talk about immigration. Immigration here, when we talk about these poor people from Latin America, from Central America, coming here, these um, ragamuffins and riffraff that's, that's immigrating into the United States. Um, when we look at all of that, we're not actually looking at what the problem is, what the problem there is. No estamos viendo las raíces del problema. So we're not looking at the root of the problem. Mucha gente cree que los migrantes vienen a quitar el trabajo. A lot of people <coughs> think that immigrants come here to take our jobs. Que somos delincuentes. That we're criminals. Pero voy a darles un dato. En 1998, Centroamérica sufrió eh, un huracán que se llamó el Mitch y devastó la región. Mitch se llama? Mitch. Um, in 1998, uh, Central America suffered a hurricane that completely <laughs> devastated um, the region, which was called Hurricane Mitch. Mm -hmm. Eso hizo que muchos migrantes centroamericanos cruzaran la frontera a Estados Unidos. And that caused many Central Americans to cross the border into the United States. Y en base a eso surgió el TPS, que es un, um, no sé cómo decirlo en inglés. Uh -huh. El, um, TPS, yeah. Temporary Protective Status. Status de protección temporada. Temporera. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, um, as, a, as a result, we had what is now called TPS or Temporary Protective Status. Eh, y por muchos años, estas personas eh, han estado aquí, no solo centroamericanos, sino también. Um, Afro, de África también, y um, ahora esta gente está siendo amenazada que le quiten ese estatus de protección y van a quedar ilegalmente. Um, so, uh, for years, these people have lived here in the United States, both Central American and um, people from Africa, under this temporary protective status. But now that temporary protective status is being threatened, and now they are um, being threatened that they're going to now be stripped of the TPS and live here illegally. Entonces, para mucha, muchos centroamericanos, el próximo año es eh, el último año. So for many Central Americans, next year will be their last. Entonces, todo está interconectado. ¿Qué tiene que ver la migración con la justicia eh, ambiental? ¿Qué tiene que ver la migración con el, con el capitalismo? ¿Qué tiene que ver la, la, la migración, la justicia ambiental? Eh, con el cambio climático, tiene que ver todo, todo está interconectado. So, you know, when you look at it, immigration is completely linked with environmental justice. Um, how is it connected to capitalism? How is it connected to climate change? Everything is absolutely interconnected. Gracias. All right, well, this was wonderful. Thank you all for sticking around. Thank you, all of you. That was Thank remarkable. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I actually wanted to make one announcement of another Because environmental justice I'm talk, um, <laughs> which is tomorrow, uh, just to keep the ball rolling. Okay, Go to as many EJ talks as you can. Uh, it's by Elizabeth Hoover, um, and the title is The River is in Us, 
achieving environmental reproductive justice in a Mohawk community um, from 4 to 6 p.m. Harvard Hall 102. We try to make it. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.